To begin our best practices, let's talk about code style. So when we talk about code style, what are we really talking about? We're actually talking about source code conventions, how we name our variables, how the code is laid out, the commenting, and basically how the source code looks and how we as developers work with it. Now there are a lot of fights and arguments about code style when it's rigidly enforced. So why do we have a standard anyway? Basically the same reason that we have those fights and arguments. Developers have individual and conflicting preferences. And if we let developers and a team all put in their different preferences, we have source code that looks completely inconsistent and is very difficult for other developers to go and grab someone else's style and figure it out. It just becomes a maintainability problem. Whereas if we have some sort of consistent code base, developers know where to look, they know what to expect, they know the conventions, so it's much easier for one developer to pick up another developer's work and not be confused by the code style. There are other things to be confused about. One thing I would say before we go too deep into all of this lesson, don't be too rigid with the code styles. I'm sure that a number of us have dealt with organizations that have extremely rigid coding standards. And I've worked in one of those as well. We essentially had a code style that was designed so that you could put source code on a tablet sized screen so that none of our methods could have more than, say, 15 lines. They could not be 80 characters wide or more. And there were all sorts of other really nitpicky things. It drove us all crazy. And they were rigidly enforced in code reviews. We spent a lot of wasted time on that standard. And we all kind of rebelled against it. That's not what you want from a standard. What you really want from a standard is for developers to agree on common practices so that they're all on the same page. This should not be something that you have to fight about. This should be something that we all agree to and want to do because it makes our lives easier. In the coming slides, we're going to have some, in quotes, rules. These are not necessarily my rules. They come from a variety of sources, including Microsoft, which of course changes their standards as time goes by. But don't call them rules. These are some suggestions. And I'll give you a little bit of an argument as to why I think they're the right thing to do but they may not be the right thing to do in your organization or your practice. The important thing is that you do have some sort of standards and that everybody knows what they are. So let's talk about naming conventions. .NET came out with a naming convention for classes, public properties, methods, and events called Pascal casing, which means the first letter is uppercase and then each first letter of each word in a variable name or a class name or a property name is also capitalized. For method parameters and local variables, we use camel casing. And in camel casing, the first letter is lowercase, and then the first letter of each word is uppercase. So it's like Pascal casing, except the first letter is lowercase. And now private and protected member variables. And here's where things get a little bit more troublesome. The last two were pretty much .NET standards, and I think everyone pretty much follows those. The private and protected members has changed over time. Right now, the recommendation is to use camel casing. But there's also a recommendation that says, well, you could use underscores if you wanted to as well. So we have underscore and then Pascal casing for the member name. What they're very sure of these days is that you don't want to use Hungarian notation, which gives you a type indicator and then followed by a variable name. So in this case, I have the type indicator for a string, str, and then my class string. That used to be a Microsoft standard, but they've gone completely away from that now because we have IntelliSense, so we can float over the variable and get the name of the class. And that's great if you always use a Microsoft editor or something with IntelliSense. Maybe not so great if you don't. I don't love camel casing because in that case, I don't know whether my variable is actually an overall class member or if it's a local member or a parameter. This is one of those things that you should discuss with your team. Constants aren't particularly controversial. In general, the standard is camel casing. In the old days, it used to be all uppercase with underscores. Of course, that's really hard to type, so that's not that much fun, but it certainly let you know that something was a constant, whereas the camel casing really doesn't let you know that. The old C, C++ convention is definitely out of favor, so I wouldn't recommend going with that. Now, previously I told you that these were recommendations and suggestions, not rules. I'm going to make an exception here. This is a rule. Make your variable name clear and meaningful. I actually had an interview once where it was a test question 
and they hid all the variable names. They just used abbreviations and letters. And it was so hard to read the code that I actually had a great deal of difficulty with the test. When they showed me the real code that had real variable names, all of a sudden everything was completely clear to me. That was the difference that clear and meaningful variable names means. Also, avoid abbreviations, except really, really common ones, such as ID or FTP or HTML. These days, we don't really have to worry about the length of our variable names, so make them completely clear and don't allow any confusion. And we're supposed to use Pascal casing for abbreviations, so HTML is capital H, lower TML, as opposed to all uppercase HTML. And we're hoping to not use underscores, except, of course, if it's the first underscore of a member that we talked about before. At least I get a little bit of a win here because I don't like to type underscores, so we're not supposed to have hard underscore to underscore type underscore name. These next conventions should be pretty obvious for anyone who's dealt with object-oriented programming. Class names should always be nouns, because classes reflect nouns. Also, property names should be nouns, again, because properties should be nouns. And method names also should be verbs, because method names imply some sort of action that's going on, so they should be verbs. By the way, if you find yourself breaking those rules, you might have some kind of architecture or design problem there. For interface names, you just prefix them with the capital letter I, and then the next letter is also uppercase for Pascal case. And namespaces. It's very helpful to use the using statement. So up at the top, you put in using system.drawing. Instead of having within your code system.drawing.color, color is equal to system.drawing.color.red. It simplifies your source code a lot more if all you have to say is color, color is equal to color.red. It's a lot fewer characters, and it's a lot easier on the eyes, particularly when the namespaces get really long. System.drawing is actually a pretty short namespace. A lot of times you end up with dot, dot, dot with a whole lot of namespaces within. Okay, so that was a lot about naming conventions. We're going to take a short break here, and we'll come back and talk about type declarations.